Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. We'll keep uh, admitting people as they join us. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, I am the host, Elitris Niels, and I'm the executive director of Conservation Catalyst. And Conservation Colloquy is a transdisciplinary platform for holistically unraveling the global problems um, in, that exist between people and wildlife. And Wildlife Wednesday is a free webinar for wildlife professionals and students interested in wildlife coexistence. These take place the first Wednesday of every month at 5 p.m. London time or 9 a.m. California time. Um, so for those of you that are new, um, we have an innovative presentation by an expert um, that is applicable to participants no matter where you live in the world. Um, and then it's followed by an informal question and answer period and um, a lively discussion session. So not only is this uh, on Zoom, but um, people are also joining us on Facebook Live, and then these are recorded and posted on our website um, for you to share with your friends and colleagues afterwards. So each month we highlight an interdisciplinary scientist that's conducting relevant research. And our guest today uh, is really um, working at the nexus of a lot of interactions with wildlife and people. Um, and so Dr. Aditi Sharma um, is also featured as a wonderful woman of wildlife um, for her female um, conservation leadership, um, particularly to um, female wildlife biologists in India and her pioneering work promoting uh, diversity within our field. Um, so Dr. Diti Sharma is a senior veterinary officer um, with a specialization in advanced wildlife management. And she is a uh, prominent expert in human wildlife interactions as we will soon hear. And for nearly two decades, she has treated her patients with great love and care. And um, this has won her a plethora of awards and recognitions. So we are really honored to have you with us, Dr. Sharma. And um, so it's with great pleasure. So please join me in um, welcoming Dr. Sharma uh, to our Wildlife Wednesday webinar. Thank you so much, Ms. Elitris. It's a really honor for me to be here on this platform and share my views and my work on this esteemed platform. So I'm really very excited to share my work with all of you. And I welcome all the attendees, all the participants who are here. So I would talk about my work. I'm actually uh, posted in uh, Tiger Reserve in the north part of India. And we have a problem of human wildlife conflict, especially on the conflict by lap between humans and leopards over there. So it's about the work which we are doing in Rajaji Tiger Reserve in North India mm -hmm. and what are the factors and what are the mitigation measures which we are taking It's all about that. So we now start the presentation. So as you see, the topic is understanding the drivers of human wildlife conflict and its mitigation measures. So whenever there is a problem when, uh, and if you want to find a solution to that problem, of course, you have to know what is the etiology of that, what is the origin of that, what factors are responsible for that, what are the drivers, like what are the factors which are precipitating that problem into the severity. And we have to analyze before planning anything because you have to do the situation analysis and accordingly only you have to plan for the strategy for finding out the solution. So... I'm sorry for this technical bit. I don't know why this slide. Uh, I'll just stop sharing and share again because I don't know why this uh, this slide is not. No problem. Yeah. It's not moving. Ah, yeah. Now it's moving. 
to the major species of wild animals which are involved first of all i want to say one thing that though i have written human wildlife conflict but actually the proper term to be used is human wildlife interaction because when we say interaction it doesn't give us a negative feeling it's the interaction between human and wild animals because both all the creatures on the earth they have equal right to live so we cannot say that the wild animals if they are coming into the residential uh, areas then we cannot blame the wild animals because we know that because of the human population explosion we have encroached into the forest area and actually we are at fault and we are moving inside their home they are not coming to our home they don't know that we have uh, cut the trees and we have converted that forest land into the agricultural land or the residential areas so i really don't want to call it conflict but uh, as the human mentality goes they don't accept their fault and they say that this is the conflict animal they never say that we are the conflict human beings they always say that this is a conflict animal so when the interaction becomes negative then we have to call it conflict otherwise i really don't like to call it conflict i want to say human wildlife interaction but now as it's neg- because of the negative impacts we are calling it conflict so the species which uh, are involved in the conflict in our area they are leopard tiger elephant bear nilgai that's a, an, an antelope nilgai wild pigs and crocodiles then the type of conflict if we want to see uh, what kinds of uh, conflict do we find in the area that is uh, some human injuries or death cases livestock injury or death cases then crop trading or damage in case of like say uh, when the conflict is uh, conflict animal is elephant then there is crop trading damage even the wild pigs they uh, raid the crops and they are a reason of big loss to the farmers then property loss and damage due to elephant conflict and of course the psychological stress and fear is also a kind of conflict which the people undergo who are living on the periphery of the forest areas because they are always scared that the wild animals can enter into their property and can harm them so now after talking about the types of conflict now we uh, really want to know what are the nature of the conflict because if we want to mitigate any kind of conflict then we have to know what is the nature like is it accidental encounter or is it intentional so when it is intentional then we use terms like man eater leopard or man eater tiger but it's very uh, like uh, we have to be very careful before using this term for any wild animal because we have to be sure that this is intentional and the animal has a habit of going into the residential area and killing or attacking the people then only we can say that it's intentional otherwise most of the times our observation is it's not intentional and it's accidental encounters which happen and lead to attack or casualties of humans or like say livestock now if we talk about the drivers of the conflict what is that which drives the animals into conflict with human beings so of course first and foremost is the explosion of human population and due to that uh, excess human population there is increased anthropogenic pressure on the forests because when the number of people are, is more day by day increasing then of course they need a lot of residential area they need the agriculture area for farming and to for their food security and all so what they end up in doing is encroachment of the forest area they keep on encroaching the forest area they convert the forest area into the agricultural land and because of that what is happening is that there is no gap between the forest area and the residential area so the result of this is that the wild animals and human beings and their livestock 
they are in very close interaction and they have very high chances of encounters with each other and uh, uh, except conflict in addition to the conflict there is another problem which happens due to this uh, close encounter and increasing uh, interaction between the three species is that disease transmission of zoonotic diseases that is another problem which arises because of the close interaction and whatever deforestation and habitat degradation we are doing so we are leading to those kind of problems also now one problem which we have in india and most of the countries they don't have this problem but the kind of wildlife protection act which is made in india it does not have a it lacks a policy for surplus population of wild animals the management of surplus population of wild animals because we are pro conservative pro conservation in india and we don't allow any kind of hunting any kind of culling nothing is allowed in india so what happens is like there is a particular carrying capacity of the area when the wild animal population exceeds that carrying capacity then of course there is a uh, lot of competition for the resources and then what they start doing is they start straying into the residential areas but because we don't have any policy for surplus population animal management we cannot control the increasing population of the wild animals but yes there are policies of immunocontraception or sterilization but that does not solve the uh, problem completely because okay they'll uh, they prevent the animals from breeding further but whatever uh, population is there at present when we are doing the going for the sterilization or immunocontraception that population will remain uh, that is another thing that uh, of course the some animals would die but that will occur with time so uh, even the sterilization programs are not that helpful because i know that uh, if we talk of the african countries like say uh, they issue the hunting permits for the excessive excess population so that is a kind of uh, management of the surplus population but we are lacking in this so we face this problem more then what we have seen is there is change with time there has come a change in behavior and food habits of wild animals for example i'm talking about leopard because now they are more habitual of straying into the residential areas so and uh, another thing is that uh, there are a number of unclaimed dead bodies of human beings which some criminal uh, kind of uh, people they just dispose after murders or uh, such kind of crimes these kind of unclaimed bodies are disposed into the forest because forest is such a large area that no one can uh, keep a keep an eye at every patch of the forest at, uh, at almost all time it's not possible so those leopards are getting those and unclaimed bodies and they are consuming those bodies so what happening what is happening is there is a change in their uh, food habit now they are counting it as a normal prey they have started counting it as a normal prey and uh, i'll also tell you about one uh, natural calamity that happened in india in uttarakhand the state of uttarakhand itself where this uh, tiger reserve is located that uh, there was a, a very uh, like devastating flood in the hills in a place called kedarnath so lot of bodies came along with the river into the river ganges which is, which is located which flows through the area where the tiger reserve is so lot of bodies from the hills they came with water into this area where the rajaji tiger reserve is located so at that time because we have seen that the number of cases of uh, leopard human leopard conflict were not that significant before that calamity happened but after happening of that calamity natural calamity because the dead bodies of humans were available to the leopards they started consuming it and there was a uh, change in food habit now another thing is like 
sharing of habitat and resources by livestock and wild animals because there are some kind of non functional wildlife corridors because of some linear developments like road highways railway tracks and all these kind of constructions all these kind of linear developments the wildlife corridors which were functional before earlier they have become non functional the animals are not able to cross those corridors they are not able to move through those corridors so now they have to take the route which goes through the residential areas so this is another problem which is leading into uh, increasing uh, of human wildlife conflict now what we have seen over the years the decreased tolerance power of people earlier what happened used to happen that they used to coexist happily along with the wild animals and uh, there were traditions like they used to uh, uh, like they uh, used to accept that forest have some god or goddess inside them and we have to religiously use whatever uh, we are taking from the forest like uh, fuel or fodder or whatever things we are taking from the forest we should be thankful for that and we should conserve that we should not overdo these things and but now what is happening is that people are overdoing the things they are harnessing the natural resources excessively they are not uh, uh, they're not actually uh, seeing that what is the uh, excess uh, resources which we can use without harming the environment or without harming the habitat so they are overdoing the things and that is why the natural resources are exhausting day by day so the people are not tolerant nowadays i mean there is a lot of communication gap between the forest department and the community because forest department they are and the this is a kind of department which is not into public dealing very much and the people also think the they, they don't uh, have the ownership of the animals because these uh, in india the all the uh, reserves and the parks they are government control people don't have the ownership of the wild animals so now they have started believing that all the wild animals are the property of the government and only government have to take care of them and the people don't own they don't have an ownership and they do they, they don't have a sensitivity towards the wild animals and uh, they say like uh, whenever a wild animal strays like elephant or leopard whatever into uh, their residential area they just call the forest people and they say that please remove your animal your animal is uh, creating problem and please remove this animal from our home area so they don't have an ownership so they don't think about the conservation and the welfare of the wild animals then unmanaged population of stray dogs is also one another important factor because they attract the leopards into the colonies where the people live so stray population of the dogs also attracts leopards and then improper waste disposal this is another big problem which we have to face because all these waste disposal these waste dumps they are are a, a source for attraction for the leopards because what people do what we have seen in the area around the rajaji tiger reserve there is a village where the people are dumping the carcass of livestock openly in the area so these kind of carcass dumps they attract the carnivores to the colony or to the dump area which is very near to the village then uh, uh, other factors which are leading to human wildlife conflict are because of the change behavior of the leopards and elephant because they are not scared of the people now because they are habitual of the encounters with the human beings so there are now more chances of unusual accidental encounters because wild animals are no more scared of the human interaction and the change movement time is also a problem because of the uh, because we have seen that behavior of the uh, animal in conflict and the animal which is not in conflict is different the animals which are not in conflict they move at the uh, in the dark hours of the day like early morning or say late night and they don't really want to encounter with the human beings but these 
animals who are into conflict they are habitual of uh, human sighting so their even movement time is also changed and people are because they are not knowing they cannot predict that this can also be the hour where the wild animal like leopard or tiger might be moving in this area so they end up in accidental encounters and they end up in uh, casualties or injuries of human beings another thing is low economic status of the people who are living on the fringes of the forest area because they have been living inside the forest earlier and now on the fringes of the forest because government policy says that they cannot live inside the protected area so they have been relocated into areas near the forest but still because they have not done anything else in their lifetime they are totally dependent on the forest and uh, they have their rare livestock and that too inside the forest they don't uh, arrange the fodder from outside they just leave their livestock into the forest to graze so low economic status of the people because they don't have anything they don't know anything else to do for their um, economy and to earn money so they take risk of their life they are ready to take risk even after the government officials uh, telling them not to go inside the forest that this is an area where the conflict animals are moving so please don't go inside the forest for fodder or or fuel or anything but they are ready to risk their lives because they say that we are totally dependent on the forest we don't know anything else to do so we have to go inside the forest even if our life is in risk so there is a total dependency of the people on forest and they are they don't uh, uh, like they are not willing to accept the threat of the uh, elephant or leopard encounters because they tell us that we have been living with these animals uh, since long years so we are not afraid of them and nothing will happen to us and you don't worry these kind of statements people give us when we try to educate them that please don't go inside the forest your life is at risk so these kind of statements we happen to listen then increased acceptance of the human presence by these animals so it's uh, both the ways that even the human beings who have been living inside the forest they are not afraid of the wild animals until unless they get to be attacked by the wild animal then only they say that uh, your animal has attacked us and now please give compensation to us and this is not fair and all and also the wild animals they have also become habitual of the human encounters so it's both way round and because of this the conflict is increasing so this is a, one case study which of uh, our rajaji tiger reserve which we did in motichur range there is a range of the forest called motichur where the maximum number of conflicts are happening since 2014 so this is the case study of that so what is the history of the man animal conflict in our reserve is that uttarakhand state has a long history by hum of human wildlife conflict and particularly with human phallid conflict and specifically not because of tiger that much but because of leopards so tiger and leopards have killed hundreds of people in early 20th century this is what the records tell us in uttarakhand and uh, there was a man eating leopard of rudraprayag which has allegedly killed 125 people so we have a record of such leopard uh, the, uh, it was in the district of rudraprayag and it has killed 125 people and ultimately it was declared man eater and it was shot dead and uh, so we what we did was the camera trapping we deployed a number of camera traps in the whole range in the gr uh, grid of 500 by 500 meters uniformly we deployed the camera traps in the whole range you can see the grid here and uh, the yellow area which you can see is the area which is non conflict zone and red area is the area which is the conflict zone and where the casualties have happened in these 4 to 5 last 4 to 5 years and what we saw was that most of the attacks or most of the casualties were near the highway they were not deep inside the forest uh, what happens is like uh, there is no public toilet on that highway that's very really unfortunate so people uh, just stop on the way for 
to attend their nature's call and in that incident they uh, happened to go inside the forest like say 50 meters inside the forest or 25 meters inside the forest and these people end up in being attacked or killed by the leopards this is the observation that they people are not being killed inside the forest deep inside the forest but of course near the highway in, in this slide you can see that we deployed the 36 camera trap pairs to study the differences between leopards from conflict zone and non conflict zone so it this study was done from november 2018 to february 2019 these uh, camera traps were deployed and this red uh, line shows the boundary of that range and this is the area of that range and the flags are the locations of the camera traps so what we found found was that the leopard density is so high that it's 33 animals per 100 square kilometer another uh, reason for this high density of leopard is that in this area we don't have many tigers in the eastern side of our tiger reserve we have around 34 tigers but on this western side of the tiger reserve we had just two female tigresses over uh, for say like last uh, 12 years we have only two tigresses and that is because of the non functional corridor the tigers from the eastern side of the tiger reserve are not able to cross over and come to the western side so th there is no breeding happening in the western side so because the population of the tiger is less so the population of the leopard is increasing day by day in that area so we found that there are 33 animals uh, the leopards per 100 square kilometer and when we uh, counted in the leopard conflict zone there were 16 leopards and in the non conflict zone there were 24 leopards as you saw sorry so as you saw that the con non conflict zone was quite uh, larger than the conflict zone but we saw that 16 leopards were there in the non uh, in the conflict zone and 24 were there in the non conflict zone and these were some observations and finding which we tried to uh, study activists we studied the activity patterns and we studied the habitat density mapping and the movement patterns so sorry i'm facing some problem by changing the slides I'm sorry for this. Just a minute. We lost your audio. Okay, just two seconds. Now is it okay? Uh we can't yeah. see your screen anymore. Uh but we can, can hear you. See? Okay, okay. Uh pass me the screen. Sorry, I'll do it again. I'm sorry. I'll share it again. I think there's some problem in that. Now are you able to see? Yes. Um okay. Yeah, we can see the screen now. Thank you. Okay. So uh, this is the movement pattern which we studied in the conflict zone and in the non conflict zone. You can see that the yellow portion is the conflict zone and the green one is the non conflict zone. And this yellow portion is uh, near the highway. So you can see the um that there is a lot of movement and there is a small distance movement in the conflict zone 
they are just moving in the smaller area very uh, vigorously and in the non conflict zone in the forest area there is not that much of movement so of course in the conflict zone because of this um, higher movement and this zigzag kind of movement pattern so people are not able to uh, predict their movement and the even the time of their movement and even the routes which route they'll follow uh, on a particular day so there are a lot many chances of encounters and that is why a number of cases are happening in this area so the summary of the study was like uh, uh, as we uh, analyzed the data it was implied that leopards are not seeking either human or cattle as prey the conflict attack just seems to be chance incidences and which seem to high during dry months in areas of water availability and moderate cover so when we say in the that they there was high conflict in dry months in area of water availability and moderate cover so you can understand that uh, because of the dry months they come to the places where they can get water near the water holes and there they can get, where they can get some kind of shady areas so whenever people go inside the forest for taking the grass or fodder or something so they encounter with these leopards who have come to the water hole or who are resting in the shady areas and they end up in attacking those people who have gone inside the forest for the fodder what mitigation measures can be taken for this human wildlife conflict uh, problem is first of all we have to analyze the situation first thing is to you have to analyze the situation what kind of conflict it is which is the conflict animal what is the nature of the conflict what is the severity of the conflict and then only you will decide how to go about its mitigation because if the conflict is not too much is not very frequent then we need not to intervene because it's uh, not advisable to intervene in each and every case some exceptional cases happen and we should not intervene in that if the severity is not very uh, very uh, like large severity then assessing the type and magnitude of conflict and then you have to plan to address how to address this accordingly we have to seek the permissions from concerned authorities because the wildlife protection act of india it says that we cannot the animals have been uh, divided into different schedules so schedule 1 is the top most priority animals and leopard tiger elephant all these animals come under schedule 1 so we cannot immobilize these animals without getting permission from the chief wildlife warden or uh, pcca wildlife so only chief wildlife warden can give us the permission to immobilize or tranquilize the animal and then only we can tranquilize the animal or capture the schedule 1 animal so first we have to identify the hot spots of conflict where these conflicts are happening frequently and this we do that we deploy the camera traps and we see where uh, the conflict animal is being captured like captured uh, by the camera trap and then we decide what are the hot, hot spots of the conflict what is the vulnerability of the people where those incidences are happening more where they are happening less and we do the predation mapping and we select the areas and then prioritize them as per the severity of the or the frequency of the conflict then we estimate the conflict species population around the conflict areas because this is also one of the factor if that species population is in access to the carrying capacity of the area then of course this is the reason of the conflict we have to know the reason of the conflict then only we can control the conflict or mitigate the conflict so we do the predation or risk mapping because it's not that uh, every time the incidents will happen then only we have to go and mitigate we have to take some precautionary measures we have to do some preventive uh, measures also so we do the risk mapping Where, wherever the leopards are being captured in the camera traps near the residential area this means that this is a vulnerable vulnerable site and this can be a conflict site in future so we have to take precautionary measures 
then assessment of preparedness and resource availability to manage the conflict this is very important because we have to know whether we have proper enough resources to manage this conflict or not first we have to check our preparedness and the capacity level of our staff or officers and then only we can go for the conflict mitigation plan then evaluation of the capacity and skills of the officers and staff to manage manage the conflict then we have to identify the conflict causing wild animal track that animal monitor and plan capture if required so i say plan capture if required because it's not that always you have to capture the leopard and you have to remove it from the area it's not necessary that you always capture and remove you can also try to avoid prevent that animal from coming coming to the uh, residential area you can adopt some like uh, physical barriers or something like solar fencing or and other kind of things uh, like virtual fencing is also being created nowadays whenever uh, there are advanced uh, alarm systems advanced warning systems you can use those kind of systems it's not always necessary to capture because capture is not always advisable uh, what we have seen is that even if we remove the animal from that area the leopard from that area the conflict leopard we capture and we shift it to some other area but the problem is not solved what we have seen is that that vacant area which has been created by removing that conflict leopard is again filled up by another leopard some other leopard comes and fill that area so problem is not solved completely so removal is not a solution always health evolution of the captured animal and we have to then decide that we have to release it or rehabilitate it so once we have captured then we have to decide we go for the test we do the scat analysis and we see whether the human dna is present in this or not and then we decide whether we have to release it or rehabilitate it if there is no presence of human dna in the scat of the leopard then we release it and if there is a presence of human dna in the scat then we shift it to the rescue center and even if the there is no human dna in the scat but if we see that the leopard is old and it has broken claws or canines then also we shift it to the uh, center because there are chances that this leopard is not will not be able to hunt the prey now and will end up in conflict will end up in uh, killing the livestock or maybe the people and when we release the leopard first we radio collar the leopard so that we can monitor it post release we can know where that leopard is moving after we have released it uh, whatever recent trends of human wildlife conflict mitigation are being used here at our places that looking at it as a human wildlife interaction not conflict so that to address it positively and spread a positive message about the wild animal interaction with the human beings then we have to create a baseline data of conflict and hot spot mapping because we need to know what are those spots where we have to address the problem what is the on priority basis then formation of dedicated rapid rescue teams or say primary rescue teams or village protection force for conflict mitigation then we build the capacity of the forest officers and the staff they uh, we give them different trainings we send them for exposure visits to the places where the conflict is being managed Uh, very nicely uh, to see the good practices so we are building the capacity of the forest officers and the staff and then we go for the public awareness campaigns to uh, make them aware about the conservation value of the wild animals and to convince them that you have to take the ownership of the wild animals it's not only the property of the forest uh, people and it's not only the responsibility of the forest people you also have to take the ownership and we promote the public participation in conflict mitigation like we make the team we select some people from the village some youngsters and we uh, include them we uh, build their capacity and we include them in the our rapid response teams so that they can give us the information whenever the animal is entering into the uh, the village they can the, give us the first hand information instantly 
then we use the advanced techniques and uh, equipment for tracking monitoring immobilization health screening recording and documenting the operation like we use camera traps then in camera traps also we have different kind of camera traps like say uh, we have the uh, white camera traps then we have black flash camera traps then we have cuddy link camera traps then we have gsm camera traps in which the moment the uh picture is uh, captured the instantly you get a the photograph in your like say laptop or mobile as a message so these kind of camera traps we have then we have gps compass range finders binoculars for tracking and monitoring of the target animals and a lot of advanced uh, alarm systems are also being used now when we use of advanced rescue equipments like catch pole then full body protector jab stick dan inject tranquilizing gun all these kinds of um, equipments which are used in rescue then public awareness campaigns we uh, these this is a very important activity because if you have to convince the public if you want the part uh, participation of the public then you have to convince the public for their coexistence with the wild animals then when we capture we do the radio collaring and then we monitor those uh, leopards or tigers or elephants after we release them and we use physical and chemical trapping both methods advanced warning systems are being used and use of different barriers like solar fencing trenches and other kind of physical barriers we use for conflict now this is up to you it's up to your discretion whether you see the conflict the solution in coexistence or you see the solution in capture it's up to you but what my experience says is that removal or capture of the animal is not a solution you are just shifting the problem from one place to another and because rescue center is like they for me this is my personal opinion like if we shift them to the rescue center it is like a life imprisonment for that them and it's not the welfare of the animals because uh, somewhere we are also responsible for this increasing conflict so we should not punish the wild animal for this conflict in which we are also a very big factor and we are also responsible for this kind of conflict so i am not in uh, uh, like i don't like to remove them and imprison them into the rescue centers i would like to promote the coexistence when capture is not always a solution because that space created by removal of the conflict leopard is soon occupied by another leopard so your problem will not be solved and density of the leopard would be same as it was before so we don't and we don't have enough and well designed rescue centers to accommodate them so shifting them to the rescue centers and if they are not getting proper food or they don't have proper space as per the norms then it's not fair with the animals and it's not in the welfare of the animals if the conflict animals are released in wild they uh, uh, we have seen that they come back to the same place even from very long distances it has been recorded so your problem in that case also will not be solved and awarding them a life imprisonment is not a very good idea for from welfare point of view then addressing the animal welfare while capturing of target wild animal it's not that if we are capturing the animal then we can use any method we can use any drug we can use any technique it's not like that we have to also make sure that uh, whatever we are doing is in the welfare of the animal and we are not giving uh, the animal unnecessary pain or stress so we should always use the drug of choice because they have a wider safety margin and we should use the correct and advanced technique of capture so that it would be less uh, stressful for the animal while it's being captured the capture operation should not be stressful for the animal and use appropriate health monitoring devices for monitoring of the immobilized wild animals because as you know that uh, any immobilization drug you are using has its own side effects on different body systems so of course some drugs they uh, decrease the respiration rate some drugs they increase the blood pressure or something so 
so it's very uh, like it's very important it's very critical that you have to monitor the animal wild animal while it's in the immobilized state and then you should always have an appropriate post capture plan it's not that you have captured the animal and you don't know what to do about it after so you should always have a post capture plan in hand before you are going to capture the animal so um, this is all from my side and now i would be happy to answer any question whatever you have thank you so much for listening to me fantastic uh, thank you so much uh, for sharing that that presentation with us uh, so now we'd love to um, welcome any questions, um, comments, those of you dealing with um, similar situations from other parts of the world. Please feel free to join in and, and ask questions to uh, Dr. Sharma. I think um, I, I have a, a question uh, for you, if you don't mind. Um, so obviously you've been involved with uh, a lot of captures and translocations. And um, my experience in capturing large predators, um, you know, this is often a time of like heightened anxiety for both people and the animal. Um, there's often media present, which, you know, exacerbates the problem in most cases. Um, and so there's, there's just a lot going on. And uh, so these, these situations can kind of quickly, you know, either be resolved or quickly turn bad. Um, and so what do you think um, is kind of the greatest strategy that you have used to ensure the success of you know, these kind of, um, you know, really high stress scenarios where you are going in there to, to capture a predator you know, at that nexus intersection with a lot of people? Okay, so this is a very uh, good question and it's very practical because practically we see this situation, we have to face the situation whenever there is a rescue operation because the people who are around, they are so curious to see the operation, to take the photographs with the leopard and so uh, what we do is we contact the uh, administra administrative authorities in that area and we also contact the police department. So we have our own teams also in place the, uh, from the forest staff to manage the mob. But we uh, usually take help from the police department to uh, manage the crowd. Mm -hmm. And we try to do the rescue operation uh, with the help of the forest people. And uh, we give yes, this duty mm -hmm. to the police mm -hmm. department. But uh, uh, such situations also that even the <laughs> police uh, man, they are also, of course, human beings. So they are also curious of taking selfies with the leopard when we capture the leopard and we, uh, we are bringing the leopard into the cage or on the stretcher or something. So uh, there are situations where the mob gets out of control then we have to convince them that if this uh, animal would just uh, wake up in between, then you will be in a very bad shape and there's a threat to your life. And one or two people, we have to like delegate them a duty to talk to the media people because uh, media people, they uh, need the pictures, they need the information, what is going on and what is happening. So we depute one or two people exclusively for this to give them the update. So if they're getting the updates and the pictures, then they uh, stay calm and away from the site. So uh, this is what we try to do. But yes, even then also we are not able to control the situation sometimes. But for me, for me, it's like, um, like the horse have these kind of <laughs> flaps. <laughs> so I just uh, look into <laughs> where the leopard is and I don't listen anything. I don't see anything else. I just focus on my work mm -hmm. and not on the mob at all. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. I have a quick question from California. Uh, oh, yeah. Seeing more and more uh, 
portrayals of predators by the media when there's conflict, especially in California, we have, you know, these expansive uh, suburban areas um, and more mountain lion conflict with hikers and just people in their backyard. How does the media portray instances of conflict in your area? Okay. So media management is uh, one very important thing. If you are uh, not giving proper information to the media, what the media ends up in uh, publishing the news, which will give them a high TRP. So they uh, sometimes they use such kind of words like rogue elephant, killer elephant, man eater leopard, man eater tiger. So just to uh, uh, attract the attention of the people towards their news. So uh, we, what we do is uh, once in a while, we call the local media people and the forest officers talk to them and we uh, try to do the awareness uh, programs for uh, exclusively for media people. And we tell them what is the situation. Sometimes we uh, take one or two media people with us and uh, we try to take them to the area, forest area, and they visit the area with us. We explain the things to them. Then only uh, you can uh, control the media. And then only the media would be sensitive about what they are writing. Otherwise, sometimes they write such news that the people also the, uh, increase the panic in the mob. Like if they are using such kind of words, killer elephant or rogue elephant or something, then the people they come into panic and they start demanding that this elephant or this leopard or this tiger should be killed instantly because we are we are in situation of threat so just because the media has published the wrong news they have exaggerated the news that is why these kind of situations happen so i think uh, the so only solution is to talk to have a dialogue with the media and to try to convince them and try to educate them about the human wildlife conflict. Great point. We had a, a really um, fantastic uh, Wildlife Wednesday from uh, Anna uh, several months ago talking about communication pertaining to wildlife, but you're right, it's, it's absolutely key to, to... I think there's a question in this chat box, I guess, from Adriana. So she's asking, what do you consider um, most important to promote coexistence? And you mentioned public participation in conflict mitigation. How much dialogue and consultation there is between the reserve management and local people? I think Just she's that call. Have a to listen to local leadership. Okay, so Adriana, uh, the, I would uh, like to answer your question. Hi, Dr. Please. Sharma. Thank you very much. It, it is a question in two parts. So please go ahead and, and thank you. Um, so uh, to promote coexistence, of course, only the awareness programs and dialogue with the people is the only solution. And what we do, we are forming eco-development com committees in the villages. Mm -hmm. And these eco-development committees, they have the people from the village itself. They are villagers. And then we use the villagers to teach the village, uh, other villagers. Because if we say something to the people, to the community, that is not that effective in comparison to when their own people from uh, amongst them, they get educated and they uh, explain the things in their own language to the community, then that is more effective. So we use those people some uh, who have interest in wildlife or who have some leadership qualities. So we select those people from the villages, from the community, and we train them and then we, along with them, we do the awareness program. Through them, we do the awareness program. And we try to, uh, we uh, celebrate a wildlife week in October, first week of October. So at that time, we try to uh, do like some competitions on making posters or uh, writing stories or some quiz on wildlife. So we contact the school children, the college children, and we try to uh, ex educate them about wildlife conservation so this is all what uh, we try to do and there are some uh, there is one more program of pub uh, police department actually but uh, we do it in collaboration with the police department we go to different places different schools different colleges different departments and we uh, educate them 
about wildlife conservation and we tell them about the value of the wildlife animals wild animals and we try to promote the coexistence we try to convince them and and one another other thing also uh, we do is uh, that we try to uh, give a uh, uh, free entry to the park for some children on some particular occasions mm -hmm. and then we uh, take them to the uh, take them through the whole track of the our tiger reserve the safari track and then we make some children as ambassadors to spread our message to the people these kind of things we are trying to do Okay, thank you very much. Um, as part of my question, I was wondering if you feel that you gain something from listening to the local people as well as bringing um, education and awareness, if they can, if they contribute to uh, the decision making as well. Yeah, so uh, like we are having a, like at present we have a, a human wildlife contract project going on in our reserve. So what we are doing is we have selected the villages on the fringes and we are doing a kind of survey to know what is their perception about wildlife and what they expect from the forest department. Like if they have a conflict problem, what do they want us to do for mitigation? It's not that we are imposing only our mitigation measures because most of the time it happens that even the uh, people, even the villagers, because they have been living inside the forest or on the fringes, they tell us a number of things, which is a learning for us also. We scientifically don't uh, think those uh, solutions, but on basis of their experiences and observations over the years, they tell us a number of things which can be done. So of course we take them into notice and we try to those, uh, do those, uh, execute those things. So yeah, thank you very much. Have listened to whatever we said. Yeah, great, great question. My pleasure. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's, uh, I think um, there's one question right now from Leah. Yeah. From Hi. Um, I have a question, but I wanted to thank you so much for your presentation. It was super interesting. Um, and I know we've all been in kind of a weird state right now with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. And um, I was kind of curious if you had any thoughts on how conflict may have changed over the past year since the pandemic has hit the world. And if conflict may have been decreasing since people have been told to stay indoors and with lockdowns and shutdowns of basically the whole world, or if that may re-increase once things open up and people go back to normal living. Yeah, okay. So I really have ob observed this thing because there was a, when there was a total lockdown, unfo unfortunately one of the elephant in our elephant camp was uh, sick. So I had to go daily to the elephant camp. So I could see that everything was locked down. No one was on the road. Uh, and the wild animals like deer species or even the elephants i saw them moving on the roads where they usually uh, uh, never came because there was no traffic no public no people nothing was there so uh, they were moving in those areas and they were like i think they were feeling quite happy that <laughs> at last we have got our place back to live but one problem which this will create because now there is no lockdown and if those animals have uh, developed this habit of coming to those areas and now lockdown has ended again there is a lot of traffic there is a, a lot of movement of people so uh, this will increase the conflict and this uh, has increased even the road accident cases also of the animals because at once they didn't uh, realize that now uh, again the situation is same as it was before people are again on the roads traffic is again on the road so in the just in the transition of uh, uh, opening of the lockdown there were a number of uh, road accident cases of animals but uh, 
conflict uh, i didn't see any effect on the conflict like uh, there was no increase uh, detected in our area i cannot say about uh, other places but in uh, our area there was no increase in the conflict okay thank you so much welcome And um, the Ashley Storms, do you have a a question? Uh, there's some question from Minnie. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, I did have a question. It kind of got touched on a little bit by um Adriana, kind of talking about the the fact that people have kind of lost their connection that they had with them, especially the forests out in India. They don't feel that personal attachment that they did. So I was um gonna ask if there was any sort of programs going on where people. are given the opportunity to kind of be re reminded of what the forest provided for them what it has for their um communities but um you touched on that and said that you guys do have certain programs going on that do allow um regular community members to interact and then help educate others with their forest environment but i was also wondering if you guys had any type of incentive program going on for like maybe the farmers that are directly along the border of the forest if there's anything for like um because they dispose of their livestock improperly there's also the issues with bodies being disposed improperly is there some system in place that actually gives them that opportunity to put it in like the right location or the right dumping spot for some type of reward on their part to sort of get them lined in with trying to help protect wildlife even if they themselves don't care about wildlife protection yeah, okay so we have some uh, positive and negative reinforcements on them like we have some penalties if the people are dumping the carcass at open places so uh, they have to give some fines or penalties and on the positive side the municipal corporation is working on this that all the open dumps uh, they should be closed and uh, people should have a, a place should be available to them so that they can dump these kind of carcass at the proper places from where it can be disposed properly collected and disposed properly but it takes time because people have developed that habit of dumping into the open places and they find it easy that they dump the carcass or the waste near to their houses and they don't want to go to the a particular place which is uh, some a little far away from their ha house and dump so it will take time to change their habit but yes uh, uh, the efforts are being going on positive as well as uh, negative reinforcement and we are also thinking of uh, like having some ele electric incinerators in place at some particular places so that they can just uh, dump their livestock carcass there and it can be disposed of properly in the electric uh, incinerator Awesome. Thank you so much for the talk today. It was great. Thank you. And then we have a few more questions. Um a really interesting question uh talking about so India has a very pro-life uh scenario with wildlife particularly um and also with domestic animals um as you alluded to with feral dogs. Um and so can you talk about um you know i guess just expand a little bit more on your experience um with you know, the sterilization programs um you know because you know, as, as you mentioned or alluded to there's a lot of research that shows that you know that really doesn't have an impact for wildlife conservation um, and you know we see this a lot um throughout the world where we have these scenarios whether it's with feral cats or feral dogs or feral horses um you know feral animals that, that that's it you know, doesn't have that direct tangible um impact as as coin as as the animals do so so in our state the animal husbandry department they have a collaboration with that uh, humane society hsi and uh, abc program is going on for feral dogs and cats and uh, through forest department we have a program for sterilization laparoscopic sterilization of rhesus macaques mm -hmm. so on these three species the sterilization programs uh, have been working mm -hmm. uh, stray dogs stray cats and uh, then uh, rhesus macaques and also on the uh, stray livestock also 
so the stray livestock it's uh, they are not being castrated but they are being captured and we have some go shalas or some animal shelters at different places even some non government organizations they have some kind of shelters where they accept the stray animals and then they take care of them so some of the non government organizations who have such shelters they are being partially supported by the like from the politicians by giving them some funds or through government department through animal husbandry department they they are give, being given some kind of veterinary services they are not giving any uh, cash services to them but yes in kind they have agreed that if they keep accept those stray livestock then the animal husbandry department uh, veterinarians would come and provide services whenever required in those shelters and uh, people were trying to uh, go for the immuno contraception in elephants also because in elephants there is excess population in comparison to the carrying capacity but because as i uh, said that our wildlife protection act is very uh, strict and uh, elephant comes in the schedule one so due to some legal issues we haven't got the permission to use that pzp vaccine in elephants but it is being uh, used in rhesus macaques on trial basis presently Thank you. And then, um, Haley, did you have a question? Oh, sorry, you're, you're muted. We can't hear you. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have any questions. I wish oh. I had come to the party sooner. Oh, no problem. Okay. okay. But I'm uh, loving to hear the positive and negative reinforcement of the practice company. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, and let's see, um, another question, I think uh, uh, just talking about, if you could just briefly um, touch on using management practices uh, such as electric barriers or fences. Okay. So uh, electric uh, fences and uh, like solar fences, we uh, have been using them uh, since say, um, a decade almost but uh, with elephants they don't work to be very true because elephants are such an intelligent mm -hmm. animals that they find the solution to each and every physical barrier after a time even if a single elephant uh, gets to know how to break this uh, solar fence then he he or she teaches the other elephants of the herd to do the same thing so with elephants these physical barriers work very less but uh, uh, people have been experimenting and they have been trying like uh, tentacle fencing is the latest thing which is being used uh, in india so what they are doing is uh, they, they are using hanging uh, tentacle fencing solar fencing and uh, that is uh, being reported as to be more effective than the single wire or double wire solar fencing mm -hmm. and uh, it has also been tried that a combination of solar fencing along with the uh, trenches mm -hmm. is being used for double security for uh, uh, like uh, to repel the elephants to prevent the elephants from coming into the areas then uh, the now we are trying to have those virtual fencing we have not started it using not started using it regularly but uh, we are trying it on the trial basis that uh, whenever the elephant or the leopard or such any animal it reaches at that place we get an alarm because of the virtual plans we get an alarm or we get a message or two sms on the mobile that the animal has reached at that place or at the boundary of the village but to be very frank uh, all the physical barriers they have their own limitations and uh, none of the physical barrier are 100% guaranteed to prevent the conflict animal because animals are very intelligent and they find a solution even i have seen the elephant that uh, he was just he sat 
and he just crawled beneath the solar fence the wire of the solar fence and moved inside the forest area they are so intelligent and another observation which i have seen is that uh, what the elephant did he dropped a wooden pole on the solar fence and he uh, just uh, um, pressed the solar fence with that wooden pole and then crossed the solar fence so we think that we are very intelligent people we human beings are supreme creatures with a big brain but animals are much more intelligent <laughs> yeah. in comparison to us so physical barriers i don't think uh, they work for some time but then the animals find the solution even some uh, uh, herbal solutions are being used and they are being sprayed on the crop to repel the animals some kind of sound systems are being used light systems are being used there is a there is an equipment which has 30 different sounds of uh, various uh, pitches uh, which is being used nowadays and it charges it has a battery which charges by the sunlight and that is being used to repel the elephant so it is giving some good uh, uh, results but i don't know up to to what time it would work and then the elephants would found the solution for that as well so this is my opinion about the physical barriers yeah good point when your entire livelihood depends on you know getting from point a to point b you have a lot of incentive to to outsmart us humans <laughs> so <laughs> i agree <laughs> i agree um uh, and um uh, but Uh, and someone asked um, if you had a picture of the electric fence that you were referring to, that tentacle fence. Do you have um, a picture of that that you can share? Or, um... Right now, I don't have a picture, uh, but but it's referred to as a tentacle fence. Is that? I can, yeah, I can share afterwards, but okay. uh, right now I don't have a picture in this laptop. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, share that with everyone. Um, are there any other uh, last minute questions? Yeah, actually, uh, is there a, a political bipartisan support for mitigating human life conflicts uh, in India or in your local community um, that is in line with how you want to mitigate this conflict? Or is there some pushback by political opponents or people who just don't see eye to eye with you? Uh, okay, so what you want to ask is uh, whether people are following the protocols or not? or i'm getting it wrong i think um you know what's the the kind of political support for um you know mitigating okay. issues with wildlife the political support is not with the forest department <laughs> it's with the people of course because they are uh, their vote banks they have elected them as public uh, representatives so uh, politicians are always on the side of the public so much so that uh, we have a provision that uh, the people if they come inside the forest and they get killed or attacked they will not get the ex gratia amount because it's a rule that you cannot enter the forest um, as per the rule so if the animal comes out and attacks on you or kills any uh, family member of yours then you will get ex gratia but if you are coming to the forest you will not get ex gratia so uh, in such cases we get a lot of pressure and request from the politicians to uh, give the ex gratia even if the person has entered inside the forest and the animal has not gone out of the forest so they always want to please the people but we have a rule to follow so that is a very uh, difficult kind of situation which we have to face and because we are government servants and uh, of course the politicians they can affect our services and uh, everything indirectly do not directly so we have to face such kind of pressure from uh, politicians which is very difficult yeah, good point i think we um, you know that that's why it's so important that us as conservation professionals uh you share these messages with the public and you know really communicate with policy makers and um, get this message out because you're right so often our hands are tied 
by so many other factors you know in regards to dealing with, with wildlife um, so very very good point um, and thank you for um, illustrating so many different topics uh, in, in a really brief presentation so i really appreciate that um, and if, if everyone could just please join me in uh, thanking dr sharma for that really enlightening presentation uh, it was wonderful for us to all travel with you and and hear um, about uh, you know, your home and um, issues particularly with leopards um, it was really fantastic uh, just a reminder that this talk was recorded and will be posted later on today. Um, so you can go to the Conservation Catalyst website um, to the Conservation Colloquy page, which is just uh, www.conservationcatalyst.com um, to view the presentation or share the link with um, any of your friends and colleagues. Um, we still um, have one slot available um, for the end of 2021 if anyone would like to nominate a speaker. So um, please continue to reach out to me if there's a topic that you're interested in hearing about um, or if you'd like to nominate yourself um, or another speaker um, to present and um, share on your experience to participants from around the world. Um, and um, please do join us next month, the first Wednesday, um, which is the 3rd of February, um, where Gail Thompson will be talking to us and we'll be traveling with her to Namibia to hear about wildlife coexistence through community-based natural resource management, which will be really interesting. Um, and um, so Dr. Sharma, just thank you again so much. This really was, was absolutely fantastic. And we all thank you, we thank you so much for inviting me and listening to me. So I would have attended. Thank, okay, thank you to all of you and Happy New Year. Yes, and Happy New Year to you too. And thank you for your, your exceptional work um, that you do uh, on this you know, really important topic. So thank you so much. Thank you everyone and uh, we will see you again next month. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>